why are we doing arts and crafts time and using this piece of paper? Life took a left turn and I went through a quarter life crisis. I had this idea and I had all the time in the world for about six months and I was just like, I'm going to start prototyping it. And now, you know what? Things happen for a reason. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums. Meaning they are taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad, Nick Fialka. Pilot, what is up? You're here. You made it. It's another week. We're doing another interview. This is a great interview. Nick Sinopoli rhymes with Monopoly. Icarus Devices. If you are a pilot, if you are a, own a flight school, if you own a military, maybe you own the United States Army or the U.S. Navy, uh, you're one of those kind of people and you've got some training that needs to happen IFR-wise and you want it legit or some other trashy way that you pretend to simulate instrument conditions, I want you to pay attention to the Icarus device. Super cool, amazing technology created by a dude who failed at what he was going to do. He failed at flight school because of the failure of his terrible IFR training devices. And so because of that failure, it inspired him. And he worked to create and engineer this amazing, um, this amazing device. You'll hear all about it. Such a great story. You know, he's a rising Phoenix. He should have called it Phoenix because he is such a cool guy. Nick and Nick in a great conversation. I think you're really going to appreciate it. Before we kick it off, though, I want to get to business. All right. Now, the most important part is the fact that this podcast, all this work, all this coordination is completely free. And the reason we do it is because we are trying to find ways to give back to the pilot group, to give back to the men and women that are so awesome that help create the community of aviation that we have. And we love it. And at Spitfire Elite Interview Consulting, we try really hard to find as many different ways to give back and to help build up and pour into the pilot community as we possibly can. If you are on the path and you're trying to get your applications reviewed or you need a resume or you need help doing whatever, all the way to interview consulting, interview coaching, whatever it is, if if you need help in your life, you reach out to us. We are here for you. We are here to make you better, to sharpen your sword. Our community is great. The coaches are um, the best in the industry. We have the absolute top coaches. There is nobody that can hold a candle to ours. The success rate is astronomical and the people that participate really just do so awesome at giving more than they are and pouring into one another as much as they are working to get themselves articulate and ready for their interview, understanding who they are, understanding their why, understanding how to communicate in a way that is impactful and puts points on the board and gets you that job offer at that dream airline. So check us out, spitfireelite.com. Use the coupon code podcast. Tell them you're listening to me and that you love it. If you do, let me know. Send us questions, show ideas, everything else as well. Podcast at spitfireelite.com. So Nick Sinopoli, I hope you enjoy this conversation. I thought it was fascinating. Let's go. And last but not least, let's have a quick word from our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have this awesome podcast. Hey, Pilot, it's Nick. I want to tell you about a great friend of the show, Timothy P. Pope. He's a financial planner and he's completely focused on the professional pilot. He's the kind of guy you want to go to for real talk to help you figure out your financial future. With so many upgrades and so many transitions and so many things going on, you owe it to yourself to give him a call. 
He'll help you design and execute really smart financial planning strategies, whether it's retirement planning, investment management, military transition, tax planning. He's a great financial planning partner. Timothy P. Pope, CFP, helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Give him a shout. All the information's in the show notes. You should definitely tell him I told you to call. All right. I'm with Nick Sinopoli. He is the owner, the founder, the creator of Icarus Devices. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing great, Nick. Uh, thanks for having me on. Hey, we got Nick and Nick. This is great. We should start a band. Nick at hey, night. Man. That's what we'd have to call it. Nick at night. Oh, gosh. Listen, you're reminding, me of, <laughs> you're reminding me of growing up. My next door neighbor's dad thought he was so funny with his freaking dad jokes about Nick at night. That guy. Cool. Anyway, that's awesome, dude. So here we are, Icarus Devices. First off, I want to know, like, the Icarus device, if I've never seen it before, how would you describe it? So it's a smart view limiting device. So it, it replaces the hood or foggles. It basically brings that simulator capability in to the aircraft. Okay. So it allows okay. that instructor pilot, safety pilot, check airman to dial in the visibility to create whatever scenario they want. It gets um, a lot of uses just for strictly IFR work. And then the helicopter world, we do a lot of invert and IMC type training with it. Okay, so I would think to describe it is as a clip-on mask when you would look at like a, a military helmet and it has the mask that comes down that's like the glasses part. It's another set of glasses that goes over and it's you can control how much you can see out of it, right? Right. And you can adjust that for different visibilities, Right. Correct. Yeah. So it's not just on or off. The instructor can sit there and dial in the visibility and change it over a set period of time. Okay. And that really allows you to, to kind of close the gap in what you can simulate in the air and get that student pilot exposed to that stuff in a safe training environment. Okay. So when I was in flight school, I'm military, we had arts and crafts day where we would go and cut out a piece of cardboard. Right. Mm -hmm. This like thick construction paper mm -hmm. in the shape of a giant lollipop. And you would stick that lollipop underneath your visor and it would get down in front of your face. Mm -hmm. And then you would go fly and they would be like and you would just be doing instrument flying. And then when you're trying to line up on the ILS and you're totally jacked up, you would kind of tilt your head back and look underneath the cardboard and line yourself back up and then do a good job. Right, because one peak is worth a thousand cross checks. Uh, oh man, for sure. I, I remember Arts and Crafts Day too at at, uh, at Flight School. I, I think we went to the the same place. Um, That's right. And yeah, it was terrible because by the end of it, it's a piece of paper, and you're jamming it in between the visors on your helmet, which are um, elastic bands. And after a while, it just gets torn up. I still have mine. Oh, do you? Yeah, I had tried to tape it so it wouldn't tear. And That's so stupid. I was in HT8, uh, the eight balls, uh, Whiting Field, uh, Milton, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I think they still do it today. I think that is the stupidest I've ever felt. I remember that feeling because you're like, this is the military. You know, we're flying. We're learning to fly in a nice helicopter. Yeah. You know, the T6 had just come online. which They were brand new off the, the line at Wichita at that point. And we're having arts and crafts day. Why does this suck so much? And Nothing like feeling like a loser <laughs> when you have 20 or 30, 22 year old guys and gals sitting there with scissors and like a big pile of construction paper. Yep. And you're like, I was the dumbest. Oh, yeah. all right. So the other side of the house is like the foggles, right? Like the civilian side of the house, which is you wear some old man safety glasses Yep. that are kind of blurred out. Yep. I tell everybody that it's the same ones that you would get for on those big bins on a factory floor that are 10 cents from China and they're just etched. I actually started out trying to build a glasses type device. Hmm. And the first prototypes were actually, they were safety glasses that I had dremeled the lenses so that two lenses would fit one on top of the other. And I would slide the, uh, oh my God. the polymer dispersed liquid crystal film. And I got <laughs> pretty good. I was very attached to my Dremel. When you're very first starting out and you have no idea what you're doing or if this is just going to be a project, and I ask any of the women in my life, I've had a few projects that never went anywhere. That Dremel is like, okay, it's 100 bucks for the Dremel or something like that. Do I really want to spend 100 uh, Okay, let's, let's see what, what goes on. And what I realized is that glasses are super hard 
to get a one size fits all. The reason why Foggle sucks so much is they're you know they have those huge temples that are gonna pinch, push, oh, and yes. that's just re- they're uncomfortable. It's reminding you that you've got something on. It is also like adding more stress into your life as you're getting your ass like beat by some instructor next to you because you don't have yep. any idea how to fly instruments, and it's a tough. You have no idea. You got somebody with a needle poking into the side of your head. Yeah, that's pretty generous. No wonder people cheat. It's very <laughs> tough. It's very tough to make sure that you can't see outside. So, you know, one peak yeah. is worth a thousand cross checks. I think there's two types of people. There's people that have looked up and seen the runway on the ILS on a same yeah, approach. You're talking to them. And people who say they haven't, but that are liars. <laughs> but there's just the simple nature of human physiology, which is if you get a peripheral cue, it's going to orient you. That's what your peripheral vision is for. It's not for, you're focusing a thousand mm. yards away, but if you can catch just a little bit of a horizon out the left and right, you can orient yourself. So what that does is it creates a huge training scar for both fixed wing and helicopter pilots. Mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. that first little bit of beta testing where it was like, we might be really onto something here where it was a helicopter pilot for a police department. And he had had some hood time and then he went up with the Icarus device. They knew that they were testing and they knew it was going to come. And he pulled the helicopter up into a kind of like a wonky hover. It was a good training event. Oh, he took off with it on? Right. Yeah. So with Icarus, you can take off <laughs> First with it time. On because it's clear. And what he ended up realizing is he went and he took his foggles and he sat in the helicopter and he realized that he was getting a pretty good horizon and he's a big, big guy. And that case is played out thousands of times for pilots so that they, whether it's fixed wing or helicopters, where it's like they had an instrument rating, but they got that instrument rating kind of being able to see a horizon. And if you don't have to focus as much on your attitude, you can get more distracted by the GPS or the transponder or whatever. So you're building in kind of a bad habit pattern into people. So that's a big reason why if you look at the Icarus device, it's a wrap around visor is because with that, it's very hard for anybody to get any peripheral cues. Right. So imagine this visor that goes from almost your right ear all the way across to your left ear. It doesn't touch your face. Mm-hmm. And then as you are working with it, it can be clear, yep. right? Clear as day. It's just like a bug smasher for you, like bug screen. And then as you're flying and the instructor's like, all right, man, we're flying into some clouds and he can push a button mm-hmm. and that thing can go from totally clear to zero, zero in like just a press of a button. Instantly. It's funny, you know, we launched during COVID. So I got a lot of COVID jokes on the internet because it is a wraparound visor and it's cut for the individual aircraft. So I go through a lot of the initial stuff that was sitting in aircraft and and just measuring instrument panels. Oh, it's okay. So if I'm flying, if I have a flight school and I fly Piper's, Mm -hmm. There would be a special one for the Piper. But if I also had like a Cessna, there would be a different one. So after a bit of kind of testing and the fixed wing one is just a centered cutout because originally they were offset for the left seat because we fly an aircraft from the left seat, a helicopter from the right seat. We realized is that the panels are usually still centered with a six pack. So we get away with a centered cutout for all fixed wing. Okay. And then for helicopters, if you're in a Huey, Great big panel, so the cutout's much larger. If you're in a Robinson R44, I think it's three inches wide. And uh-huh. there was definitely some trial and error there. And then it's set for the seat. So almost all helicopters are flown from the right seat. There's a few, like an MD500 and an EC130 is usually flown from the left seat. And some operators, I'll sell them left and a right seat. And you can custom, you can custom make them. Yep. And they're all still kind of custom made at this point, which is, uh, you know, I, I do kind of a personal, try and make it as much of a personal touch. And Sure. Where do you make them? So I have a small office south of Madison, Wisconsin. I've got kind of like a, a workshop and a couple little offices. So Can you uh, also use it to like scrape the ice off of your windshield since you're oh in Wisconsin? Gosh. Have you ever? Yeah. <laughs> I need to get back up there. I kind of missed the first snowfall was happening when I left to come down. I'm down in Austin right now. So yes. I know it's going to be cold when I get back there and I'm uh, uh, not looking forward to it. 
So the like, I think we've got the device kind of figured out, right? It is basically that thing that gives the instructor or that like anybody practicing like yep. the opportunity to go from sky clear, you know, two miles viz, one mile viz, three quarter viz, RVR, you know, mm-hmm. RVR six hundred down to zero, and really without being able to see that horizon and cheat. Yep. Which means I would probably have never gotten my wings if I had this device. Okay. It's a long way to figure this out, man. So yeah. you talked about being at Whiting with a piece of paper. Like, can you give me the background on how you figured all this stuff out? I'll try and make this somewhat succinct and kind of summarize the last eight years of my life. All right. There's your challenge. This is like an airline interview. So, yeah. so okay. went to school for engineering, went into the Navy, it was ROTC. Go Navy. Was selected helicopters. I'm actually, say this too loud, I love VFR flying. That's my jam. I do not like instruments. And I was not a strong <laughs> instrument student. I don't know how much of this I should admit. It was probably just a product of how I learned how to fly or just what I love about flying. But anyways, it was at Whiting and we almost hit a bird while I had just taken off. I was on a PAR approach. A PAR is a precision approach uh, where somebody talks you down and it's like the most beautiful thing you have ever heard, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, There's so a, you're on course, you're on glide. Yeah, we took off out of Whiting after takeoff, and then right into your before landing, and you're coming around, and you're you're that young student with the, your head on fire, and you've got this piece of paper on your head. And we're mm. over Peter Prince Airport, which is just south of Whiting Field, In little Alabama. Small, yeah, it's just a little Florida? small Alabama. It's I think it's Florida. It's just a small general aviation airport. They stay under 800 feet. We stay above 800 feet. We're over that, and the instructor swipes the cyclic straight out of my hand. We go hard left. And then him and the guy in the back start debating whether or not we almost hit a bird or a plane. <laughs> and it turns out it was this big buzzard. It passed inside the rotor arc on my side, on the right side. We came back, we landed. I was a soup sandwich a little bit because it was just, it was kind of jarring. And I had this piece of paper on my head and, you know, a lot of things are going through your mind. And I'm like, why? So you're already not good at what you're doing, right? I'm it's already not invisible. good at what I'm doing. And it's just, it kind of rattles you and we're walking away from the flight line. And around that time, the 77, the Dreamliner just come out and it has electrochromatic windows in the back seat, all the back seats. How do you even know that? I'm a nerd. I'm just, <laughs> it took me 33 years to just be like, you know what? I'm just going to shoot you, you know, cut to the chase. I'm a nerd. I was an engineer. I am an engineer. Anyways, I was like, if Boeing can figure out how to put that in every single window in a jetliner and make it cost effective and weight effective and energy effective, why are we doing arts and crafts time and using this piece of paper? Ugh. And long story short, life, life took a left turn and I went through a quarter life crisis and I got yep. left with this, like I had this idea and I had all the time in the world for about six months and I was just like, I'm going to start prototyping it. And I would I, like to, if you're okay, I'd like to tell why you had time. So I failed the instrument check ride of uh, the last check ride of flight school and Failed one check ride in flight school. Was two weeks away from, from getting my wings. Was had dreams of San Diego, and it was a rough time in my life for some other reasons. And it was a rough time in my professional life. Obviously, I had that was kind of like you know I had that plan, and it takes a left turn. Spent a lot of time angry in my life, and now I'm kind yeah. of like, you know what? Things happen for a reason. Yeah, and then so, Navy gave you an opportunity to walk away after that check ride because we were in a big budget crunch and then you're at the end of the fiscal year. And it's like, yeah, I've been there. I've done that. I know. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is because of the massive success that you are right now and let you continue your story because I think your story is amazing and you're yeah. one of my heroes. Thank you. Yeah. So at that time, my best friend had just joined the Navy you know, like me, he, he was falling some idiot like me into the Navy. And he was, he was an NFO. <laughs> and at uh, that's the a naval time, flight officer, right? A guy in the back seat of a jet or a P3, things like that. ETs. At the time, the Commodore in Pensacola, which is where they train all the NFOs, was a Purdue Aero grad. Yeah. And for a while, you know, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll be an NFO. And I wrote a letter about why I wanted to stay in the cockpit, why I wanted to be an NFO. And the training officer at Whiting read it. And I'll never forget this meeting till the day I die. He was like, it seems like you really want to fly. And I was like, that's all I've ever wanted to do. He was like, are you, you loyal to the Navy? And I was just like, 
I kind of stumbled a little bit, and I was Boy, like, the you know, and, you know, I'm you know, not in the like, Royal like, Navy. Like, I've been in it 22 years. Yeah, and he was just like, he's like, screw the Navy. They screwed you over. He's like, you are not going to be happy sitting in the back seat, not on the controls. He's like, if you want to get out and go fly, get out and go fly. Um, and it was just this very like, I got to go. And I ended. Did up, you feel like you needed to go? Were you like, yep, you're right. I need to get out of here. I had already kind of been thinking about it, but I just didn't know how that was going to work. And yeah, and when you're that, when you're in your early twenties, and you spent, you've been an ROTC for all those years. That's kind of wrapped up in your identity. It's hard. Yeah, to Yeah, right. I'm just gonna, and you also you're getting a steady paycheck, uh, which we all take for <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, yeah, I know. They held on to my paperwork, and the Commodore switched, and I never ended up going down there to board for NFO. And I mean, jokingly, like put down, like I'd want to transfer to the SEALs and, you know, cause they, <laughs> they knew, they knew I didn't want to go. And I had had some friends that were good, great Naval officers. Like I have a friend that he was, a uh, he would have been such an asset. He got air sick, everything, mm. nothing to do with him. Oh, yeah. Would have made a great SWO, would have been a great Intel officer, would have made a great whatever and didn't get picked up. So I kind of had this, like, I'm not going to take some slot from somebody that, you know, yeah. with a numbers game and kind of got out and spent about 10 months on the IRR and then went into the National Guard. Okay, so you went into the reserves and they went into the National Guard. Mm -hmm. And now on your guard world, what are you doing? I went to be an artillery officer. <laughs> so <laughs> I was an artillery officer for about two years, spent six months at Fort Sill learning manual cannon gunnery and yeah. uh, getting a very, very down and dirty army education. Because it was weird. I was a direct commission from the Navy Having never oh, yeah. never gone to the field, never shot an M16 or an M4. So um, clearly camping is no fun. Oh, gosh. So I'm, are you still doing that part? I'm not an artillery officer anymore. What are you doing now? I fly the 60 Mike. Oh, so, so I, I, got, I got my shot at redemption. And, you know, That's it, it. it's funny when times get tough, like I have to, sometimes I have to stop and just take a deep breath and realize, because there was so many long nights yeah. Just wanting to go fly. And it was extremely tough, especially in this day of social media, when you're watching all your friends go on their deployments in the fleet and flying Hornets and 60s and P3s, P8s. And you're sitting there on, I was on the sidelines for, gosh, from 2014 to 28, four years. So like, at what point here do you start creating this device? I believe I had the first... I started prototyping in late 2014 and I had mm -hmm. the first kind of like proof of concept, the thing that you could fly with in January of 2015. And when I say thing you could fly with, I mean thing I could put on and like in a Cessna and it would work half the time. Um, and then, so, so the version that you have right now, like how long has that been around? About two years. There's been a ton of small changes, but you could look back from two years ago and you couldn't really tell the difference from a picture. Um, yeah. You know, I've been through a lot. I have a folder on my computer of just like, I mean, they looked pretty, pretty rink-a-dink for a very long time. And, you know, I got that first piece of film. That was one of the things that was sitting at my house in Pensacola and my roommates are about to wing and, like I said, on the sidelines. And you're mad scientisting stuff. Yeah. And I, I was like, you know, doing the research on the internet and stuff like that. And they'll, the film that I use, it's called Palmer's First Liquid Crystal. It's in that same vein of technology that they use on the 787 or they use it in business jets actually a lot, I found out. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been to like a fancy hotel or a boardroom that has, it's electrochromatic glass. So, you, you know, you flip a switch and it goes clear, and you go the other way and it goes opaque. You know, they'll sell you a sample kit for a couple hundred bucks. And oh, cool. I just remember being like, there's two competing interests when you know you're about to get out of the Navy. First, you're like, should I just save my money? Because I really don't have a plan right now. Of course. Or B, you're like, I have $300 in my bank account. Like, And that's all. Put that credit card information. I get it. And I'm messing around with the electronics because usually it's plugged into wall current, 110 volt AC. Mm -hmm. So you need something to, you can't run it off a battery. And I shocked myself a million times. I got a C <laughs> in electricity and magnetism in college. But, I didn't uh, know that was a class, so uh, good job. <laughs> uh, and I'm messing with it, and it looks like kind of going in and out of clouds. And there's something that is, he's a Huey pilot, had told me on a weather day 
he was like, going inadvertent IMC in Pensacola was scarier than getting shot at in the Huey in Afghanistan. Yeah, Pensacola is terrifying, especially with the towers. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. he was on uh, course rules. So, you know, pretty yeah. low to the ground. And yeah. uh, now, since then, I've been doing this a little bit. Other people have told me, like, yeah, getting shot at, got it. Going into Vietnam, IMC, terrifying. Terrifying. Um, so I started kind of, proto, you know, and it was, you know, I went through a lot of ups and downs, did the whole, made the first ones in a garage, then quickly moved into my basement. <laughs> and and just constantly trying to improve it and it was this cycle of you know you've got to make something get it out there and have it kind of tested and come back and how are you finding the people to test this are you just like you know some bros that fly uh, a lot of cold emails really yeah kind of like me in this podcast yeah and then i think of one of my favorite beta testers a guy named ben tong in michigan helicopters former ems pilot he, he now runs a, a flight school up there outside of detroit and he just, you know, he messaged me on Facebook and he was like, Hey man, whatever I got to do, like, can I help out? And he's a good friend of mine now, but the people that were willing to deal with the issues or, you know, I don't have really many as, as bad of issues as we used to, but power control unit would not work or, you know, you're flying a, a helicopter, an airplane or something like that. So it, it kind of took a bit. And I, I learned a lot of things the hard way, but that was kind of my education. So somebody like you would go to your buddy and say, Hey, look, strap this thing on, mm -hmm. run it through. Like, did you have, you know, like a test pilot would have all the run it through these different processes. We never did like, you know, do like a test card. It was always kind of like, can you just integrate this into your, what you're already doing? And it is, it's not a perfect drop in replacement for hoods or foggles because you can do so much more, but you know, even if it's not powered, it works just, you know, it looks just like a, it limits your view just like a, a set of hoods or foggles. Yeah, it um, does. Like your device does way more than a hood or foggles does. Like yep. light years more. Who are the people that benefit the most? Like obviously the pilot benefits the most, but like your customer is what kind of like perfect person? So I've sold, I mean, it's the entire, almost the entire gamut. The airline okay. industry is that one is that outlier. Like I'll never sell directly to American airlines just because that's, you don't get to American, Air, you know, Delta or any of that without a lot of hours. Now, sure. Their pilot training pipeline, of course, I'd want to be in those schools. The perfect, you know, no matter if you're getting your private pilot's license in a Cessna 172, or you're learning to fly a, you know, TH 73 in the Navy, you're going to need to do instrument time. TH 73, listen to you. The Thrasher. Yeah. I was like thinking 57. I was like, let's use the new lingo, the new, <laughs> the, the new, the new ships in town. Oh man. After a hundred years. The kind of go to market strategy was we're going to start really in the civilian helicopter industry because, you know, the device doesn't require an SDC or anything. You can just throw it on there. And what's an SDC? Supplemental type certificate. So I don't need one of those, but if you are attached to power, if you use aircraft power or you rigidly mount to the airframe, you need an STC. Mm -hmm. uh, comes to odds to military stuff because military has their own kind of forms of STCs and stuff like that, but I don't have an FAA one to be like, hey, I got this for the FAA. Is that a big hill to climb to try to get that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been falling up that hill for a couple of years and I'm getting better at, at kind of managing it, but grit and persistence will get you kind of far. So, you know, the civilian helicopter industry, law enforcement, EMS, they want a solution for inadvertent IMC training. And that's inadvertent instrument meteorological conditions. There's actually like four acronyms. People are trying to make unintended IMC a thing, VFR into IMC, call what you want. In the military, I feel like we all call it inadvertent IMC or double IMC. There's a lack of good training for it because in the helicopter, you can't really do it with hoods or foggles because you'll know it's coming. Yeah. yeah. In the simulator, if you can find a simulator that is replicative of your aircraft, it's probably super expensive. And even if it is the greatest simulator, ground-based simulator out there, you can't replicate what it feels like to be in a, a Bell 407 and yank that collective up and start climbing like a homesick angel. There's yeah. just no way to do that. Yeah, you feel so, a little bit of G's in your pants and you're like, I'm a helicopter guy, I shouldn't be feeling these G's or anything else. And basically, if you have the potential to fly into clouds by accident, mm -hmm. this is a device for you to get better. Yep. Even if you're just in, I saw a lot too private instrument rated pilots who maybe own their own aircraft 
Mm-hmm. They just want to yeah, be for sure. proficient. I can think of one customer very vividly because I talk to a lot of them and, and people will tell me their stories. So if you've ever gone to Invert and IMC, I've probably heard it. When we talk, you know, it's an emotional experience for a lot of people. But he had, yeah, gotten, sure. he had gotten his instrument rating, passed his check ride, and using hoods and foggles. And the first time he actually went into the clouds, his wife and kids were on board. Oh, my God. And you know? he obviously landed safely. And it was a bit of an emotional experience for him because he was feeling stuff that he had never felt before. And he was all alone. Yeah. So being able to simulate that to a higher level of fidelity without being letting people cheat and kind of putting that surprise factor, which even if you're on an instrument flight plan, taking off into 500 foot ceilings can be an emotional event that first time you do it because, you know, we are visual creatures. So yeah. giving that pilot a higher, more bang for their buck. And that's, that's the thing I tell a lot of people. And especially when I was starting out at especially before I really had sold anything, had that flight testing or, or all that user feedback to rely on, people be like, you'll never get anybody to pay more than 20 bucks for a set of foggles. He's like, people are, flight schools are cheap. That's all they're going to do. And flight schools are cheap. I'm still trying to work on selling all the big flight schools and all that stuff. But there's a lot of people, especially private CFIs, if this is your passion, you know, maybe you got another flying job that pays more of the bills. The cost of the device it's paid for it by what you can provide your students in terms of the quality of your training and the professional pride of, hey, I make the best. Sure, you're the best pilot and I use the best tools to do it. You know, yeah, it's a great selling point for them. You can dig a hole with a shovel. I can give you a shovel and you can dig a hole and it's going to take you a while. But if I give you a backhoe, you're going to do it much, much quicker and much better. Yeah, I, or I don't, uh, buy I don't some, really, pay somebody really, to do it. I don't really have the... Uh, we're just, we got a, a bit over 200 of the devices flying and I don't have all the data, but the next thing is to, you know, I've heard anecdotally, like, I don't know if this person is just a hot pilot or the device really helped them, but they're great instrument pilots and they've used it their entire time. So there's some anecdotal evidence that it does produce better pilots quicker. Oh, I'm sure. It only makes sense. You may or may not be old enough to remember when JFK Jr. killed himself. He was flying and he went in invert an IMC, flew into the clouds by accident. He mm-hmm. was not instrument rated and he probably he probably had a couple flights on foggles and stuff like that, planted it right into the ground. So I don't remember yep. if he hit the ground or the yep. water, but it, he didn't make it. He hit the water, classic graveyard spiral. Mm-hmm. He was in a Piper Mirage, which is a big single, you know, the big motor up front. And yeah, he was like halfway through his IFR training. Yeah. And I tell people about once a decade, somebody real famous. Obviously, the Comey Bryant accident is Ugh. the most recent one. Uh, before yeah, that was JFK so Jr. Sad. And then near and dear to my heart, 10 years before that was, uh, 10 years before JFK Jr. was Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, yeah. And just to give you a little bit of personal background. So I live in Madison. I'm from Austin. My parents met in Madison. My dad was from Chicago. My mom's from um, New Glarus, home of Spotted Cow. Anyways, yeah. my, my parents moved to Austin because in the winter, in Wisconsin. He came down to Texas for some work. He drove up on the weekend, saw Steve Ray Vaughan at the Continental Club in Austin in the very early 80s. And for, cool. for those of your listeners that don't know, one of the greatest guitarists to ever live, Steve Ray Vaughan. Ever. ever. But I grew up with stories of Steve Ray Vaughan. You know, my dad was a big Stones guy about how he had just gotten clean. He was addicted to heroin, like yeah. far too many musicians. Just gotten clean, was playing the best music of his life. Played a show in Alpine Valley, which is in Wisconsin, mm-hmm. in uh, south southeastern Wisconsin. Played a show with Eric Clapton. They had three Bell Jet Rangers to take the band down to Chicago to catch planes. First two were flown by ex-Army Vietnam Air guys. The third one was flown by a new hire. If you ever go to Alpine Valley, there's the the stage, there's a golf course, and then on the other side, there is ski hills. So the, the, behind the, the stage, the three helicopters are lined up on the golf course. And because I fly in that part of Wisconsin now, as often happens, the sun goes down, the temperature and the dew point get closer and closer and fog starts to form. So they played encore after encore. The three aircraft are, are going to take them down. The fog starts rolling in. And the third pilot, the one that was flying the, the helicopter that took uh, Stevie, 
was like, I don't know about this. And the Vietnam era guys were like, suck it up, buttercup. We got paying customers. They got to get back to Chicago. And the three of them, they take off. Stevie Ray Vaughan was trying to catch his mother's birthday. I think he switched with Eric Clapton's manager to take his seat. That's right. They took off. And uh, having now flown over it, I can see exactly how it happened. They snagged a skid on the the ski lift wire, flipped the helicopter oh. right over, killed everybody. Man. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of examples of, especially in the music world, of bad, poor instrument flying or just weather decision making, whatever you want to call it, spatial disorientation, leading to leading to unfortunately fatalities. Yeah. So, and- you know, I think the moral is you're always taught, like, you have to trust your instruments, but also, like, to be able to trust your instruments, you have to have that experience. And right. that's where you and your product have just been awesome. I personally, I think it's an amazing device. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you you go over to the website. Can you tell the, the kids at home uh, where to find you? Yeah, so IcarusDevices.com is our website. We're on all the social media platforms and all that stuff. One thing we do love, if you do get a chance to fly with it, we love pictures and review. I'll send you some swag. Because uh, that's what really, you know, pilots love to talk. How do you know somebody's a pilot? Don't worry, they'll tell you. So that's right. word of mouth is kind of the, the biggest thing. You know, don't take it from me. Take it from a pilot that is not trying to sell you something that, hey, this training really pays off. So... It's been a kind of a crash course in business and marketing and all that stuff because you got to wear all the hats when you're starting sure. out. Sure, sure. And then I uh, got a great team now, small team, but great team. And uh, yeah, we're getting it out there, looking to forward to a big uh, 2023 and kind of growing the product line. And we've made some changes recently that I think are, are working out pretty well. So first off, I'll put everything in the show notes. That's an easy one. So if you guys are interested in checking it out, just click the show notes and it's right there for you. It's very, very easy. The reason I brought Nick on is because his innovation is its probably one of the greatest inventions in the industry in the past 20 years. It is really like ADSB, absolutely. But like this simple idea that is so compelling that can save so many lives. If you're running a flight school, if you own a company that is flying aircraft where people are doing a lot of VFR flying and then you need it on your shoulder. You're on your own plane and you're a doctor and you're listening to this podcast because it's super fun and have terrible jokes. Like you owe it to yourself to go check it out because throughout, as this becomes kind of the standard for aviation, it's only an opportunity for you to get better as a pilot. So Mm -hmm. Nick, thank you for spending some time with us. Just so fascinating. So interesting. And plus I love C. Ray Vaughn. (laughs) So I should have um, worn, I've got some of his concert t-shirts still. Oh my yeah. God. That's so cool. I just, uh, smoke a lot of cigars and, uh, <laughs> my Stratocaster doesn't look like his, but it's all right. Hey brother, thank you so much for spending time with us and gosh, what a cool thing. Go check it out. Icarus devices, Nick Sinopoli. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks Nick. I really appreciate it as well. All right, brother. See ya. Hey, before I let you go, I need to mention one thing because a lot of people are asking me. Can you do anything? Can you help me with this? And the answer is yes. At Spitfire Elite, we will make more millionaires this year than Major League Baseball will make in the next five years. Our company actually does this. It's called Spitfire Elite Interview Consulting. And you can find us over at SpitfireElite.com. Our clients, they call us the easy button for interview prep because everything you need to crush your interview is there in one spot. Whether it's application review or interview prep, all of it is covered. We've helped thousands of clients who are now flying at their dream jobs because our coaches gave them the one-on-one feedback that they needed to succeed on the biggest day of their life. The best part of Spitfire is our community. All Spitfire clients will get access to our private chats where they can work with each other and they can work with our coaches and get the latest information on all the airlines. If you'd like to make sure that you are 100% ready to go on your big day, there is only one choice. Everything you need is in one place, and I think it's pretty affordable. You'll have to take a look for yourself. Just go over to SpitfireElite.com and check us out. Use the coupon code PODCAST and it'll save you 10%. And by the way, I will see you on the next episode.
The statements made on this show are my own opinions and do not reflect, nor are they under any direction from my employer.